A paper makes a tree of life for plants, but the tree gets chopped down. A tutorial on how to win an argument against creationists, and a full mailbag. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the Walk TV in the United States, and of course, the Chris Cinema Network on YouTube. ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we snuck into the abandoned Domino Sugar Factory in New York and set up our studio so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. God did not say, be ye transformed by the removal of your mind. Rather, we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. You don't actually see a lot in the evolutionary literature about the evolution of plants. It's there, it's assumed, but it's not at all like animal evolution. Though the evolution of plants is just as much a mystery as that of the animals. A paper out in Nature magazine discusses a study conducted which attempts to trace how plants evolved to cope with the cold. Bulow et al. laid out some 32,000 flowering plants and built an evolutionary tree based on their age and environment of the rock layers they were found in. Now, from this evolutionary tree, the researchers claimed to have constructed how the plants evolved to cope with the cold. They concluded that the plants developed the ability to cope with the cold long before they ever saw cold. Now, I do hope no offense is taken as I dissect this paper the circular reasoning is glaring as they constructed an evolutionary tree based upon evolution. This was then used to allegedly prove evolution. Now let's use the alleged horse evolution, a case study still used in many museums and textbooks to prove evolution as an example. We are shown that the allegedly oldest fossil in the series is the smallest, the most primitive. The fossil found in the highest rock layers, and therefore considered the most recent, is also the largest and least primitive of the horses. Now evolution is assumed, the rock and fossil sequence interpreted according to evolution, which is then used to prove evolution. Now here's what they don't tell you. First of all, when you actually look at the skeleton of the Heracotherium, you'll notice that the blades on the back of the vertebrae of the spine show that the spine has actually been flattened in the reconstructions. The Heracotherium did not have a spine at all like a horse's, which bows down. But rather, the Heracotherium spine arched upwards. The Heracotherium was nothing to do with the evolution of the horse, and is no relative. Secondly, this fossil sequence doesn't exist. In fact, the reverse sequence has been found in South America. So, did the modern horse evolve into the Horacotherium? Because if you use the same evolutionary assumptions, that is what the evidence would show. So now let's come back to our nature paper on plant evolution. The same circular arguing has been used. Date the plants according to evolution, interpret the sequence according to evolution, then use that interpretation as proof of evolution. Notice the evolutionary assumptions behind the interpretation. The researchers assumed evolutionary timescales and the assumption of the fossil sequence and that the fossils that appear in the rock record actually represent the fossils of that time period. We have shown on this show how all of those assumptions are just plain erroneous. The fossil sequence doesn't exist as you can find huge reversals of the rock record 
in hundreds of places throughout North America alone. Now, the ages assigned to those rock layers are given based on the fossils found in those layers. So in the case of our plant study, the rocks the fossil plants are found in are assigned an age based on the evolutionary age assigned to the plants. Those ages were then used to date the plants, and those ages then used to build the plant a tree of plant evolution. Confused? Don't worry, it's not your fault. We also showed in shows past how the absence of a fossil in a rock layer does not mean that the organism wasn't there when the rock layer was made. We showed multiple examples, such as the coelacanth, which is around today, yet absent from the rock record for the past 70 million alleged years. So the foundations of the assumptions of the plant study are just plain wrong. Furthermore, as has been acknowledged by even evolutionary researchers themselves, sometimes plant identification and reconstruction goes awry. For example, the Lepidodendron plant trunk and the Stigmaria were considered two different plants, and thus given two different names. Later on, the two were found attached to each other, and the Stigmaria were discovered to actually be the roots of the Lepidodendron. Now, not a big deal, except when such discoveries influence evolutionary interpretation. Now, in the Carboniferous rocks, which, of course, my American friends will call the Pennsylvanian, you'll find fossil leaves like this, which are assumed to belong to the ancient pine tree called the Cordatales. Now, as Ferguson points out in his book on the Carboniferous rocks of Joggins, Nova Scotia, the leaves look just like those of the Amaryllis. Now, the Amaryllis is, of course, a very well-known flowering plant, even commercially produced because of its flowers. Now, because of evolutionary assumptions, it is assumed these cannot be Amaryllis leaves, because flowering plants would not yet have evolved during the Carboniferous period. But yet these fossil leaves have never been found attached to the very common fossil trunk of the Cordatales pine tree. So here we may have evidence that flowering plants were around at that time, yet the evidence is interpreted in completely the opposite fashion because of evolutionism. Now, there is one other hidden assumption in the research paper. The rock layers are not assumed to be from a worldwide flood. The rock layers are assumed to represent a specific time and environment. How do they know the environment? Well, because of the fossils found in the rock layer, combined with what we know of these organisms today. However, as we saw in recent episodes of Genesis Week, we find fossils of trees in the Arctic and Antarctic, yet these fossils showed no late wood. Evidence that these trees grew in a tropical climate. What on earth are they doing in the North and South Poles? It sure ain't tropical there today. We also saw that the fossil trees were interpreted to have been buried in the living position, right where they grew. Yet a closer examination of the evidence showed that they had actually been ripped up and transported from some unknown source to the poles. Further study of the fossil beds almost invariably shows a mixture of environments, almost always including both sea life and land plants. For example, the Joggins fossil cliffs represent a huge mixture of environments, swamp trees, giant horsetail reeds which grow on dry land today, amphibians which live in both land and water, fish and clams from the ocean, damselflies, and even a scorpion, which you would expect to find in desert environments. In short, you cannot deduce the environment from the fossil assemblage you find in the rocks, because invariably the fossil beds have been produced by a flood. So in the end, this very extensive research paper, written by some 26 researchers, did not demonstrate evolution whatsoever. Now, it laid out an interpretation of the evidence within the context of evolution, but nothing more. And that interpretation is flawed from beginning to end because the foundations of the interpretation are demonstrably flawed. 
Now, unfortunately, probably 90% of the scientific papers given supporting to, uh, that are given supporting evolution do exactly that. They interpret the evidence within the evolutionary paradigm. Then anti-creationists and pro-evolution lobbyists hold up those papers as proof of evolution. However, all of this evidence can also be interpreted within the context of a young created Earth and life. In fact, the Young Earth Special Creation Model explains the evidence better than evolution because we don't have the contradictions caused by the flawed foundational interpretations. The vast majority of the rock record represents flood deposits, which is why you see the mixture of life forms and environments. And it's no surprise to us when you find fossils out of order or in the wrong place, because there is no wrong place for a fossil to begin with. Only evolutionism requires a fossil sequence. Both evolution and creation require a belief in miracles, because both require you to believe in something that has never been seen or scientifically observed. The rise of different kinds of plants. Now yes, you get variation within the plant kinds, but even within the millennia of observation, corn has always been corn. It has never been observed to give rise to a plant other than corn. So where did the first corn come from? Well, take your pick. You can believe that millions of miracles took place to turn some other plant into corn, completely against modern day research and observation in genetics, completely against natural and scientific laws like the law of biogenesis, or you can believe that a creator who created those scientific and natural laws also designed and created the plants which have reproduced after their kind ever since. Exactly what the Bible says ten times in the first chapter of Genesis, and exactly what has been observed scientifically for millennia. Stick around, we'll be back in just a minute with the mailbag. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12-DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. for me? As many of you know, I get a lot of criticism and hate mail on a daily basis, in particular from the anti-theists. After seeing many a young and inexperienced anti-theist make so many mistakes, I thought I would put together a short tutorial on how to win an argument against a creationist. The first and most important step, which you will see throughout this tutorial, is at all costs avoid any discussion of evidence or conclusions. There are a great many ways to do this, and one of the most effective ways is to pull out the liar card. Now you can pretty much guarantee I get this one from the professional anti-theist on a daily basis. I'll make a statement like, the law of biogenesis states that life only comes from life, because evolutionism has life arising from non-life in direct violation of this scientific and natural law. Evolutionism is therefore neither scientific nor natural, but by definition of the word, a supernatural process. Professional anti-theists will then reply with, Ian Chuby is a proven liar. Oh, don't worry that even secular philosophers recognize this as a glaring logical fallacy or an illogical argument called ad hominem, or attack the man, not the argument. Hey, use it. It's an effective tactic. It works. You have just avoided any and all discussion of evidence, science, or facts, showed the world that the creationist was deceitful, and just advertised your intellectual prowess. 
you can proudly stand alongside greats like Charlie Sheen and shout, winning! Now let's overlook the irony that by publicly making false accusations, you've just made a liar of yourself. Let's also overlook the fact that if Ian Juby even was somehow a proven liar, that still has nothing to do with whether or not his statement was true, as even compulsive liars occasionally tell the truth. Oh, and be careful using that word proven in your argument. You should avoid using that word when using the liar card, because now you can be challenged to prove that he's a liar, which brings you to discussion of facts and truth. Uh, this must be avoided at all costs. But a highly skilled anti-theist will simply disagree with the creationist statement, then claim that because they're right and the creationist is wrong, therefore the creationist is a liar. And after all, if the creationist denies that they are lying, well, you just point out that he's a liar, and now he's lying about not lying. Tactic number two is an offshoot of tactic number one. Question the person's credibility, usually by calling upon their credentials or lack thereof. Let's say I make a statement like I did on the Geological Column Busted program, where I completely dismantled the concept of the alleged fossil sequence showing evolution. Showed there was no sequence at all, concluding that evolution requires and is based upon a fossil evolutionary sequence. But there is no fossil sequence. Therefore, evolution is foundationless when it comes to fossil evidence. An anti-theist might respond, Hey Juby, what is your science degree in? Yes, yes, I know that this is also subtle ad hominem attack. But hey, don't think this thing through or anything, okay? I mean, remember, you're trying to win an argument against a creationist, which must be done in blind, unthinking rage. The moment you even acknowledge the evidence, you're done for because the evidence is on the side of the creationist. Now, this particular anti-theist was also highly skilled, as their attack was both subtle and disguised as a question. Ooh. The anti-theist has successfully avoided any discussion of facts or evidence while calling into question the credibility of the creationist. Ah, if the creationist happens to have a degree in that particular area of a science, it is very important that you downplay their credentials, either by claiming that they got their degree from a degree mill, or they didn't rightfully earn it, or return to tactic number one, label them an obvious proven liar, and therefore they must also be lying about their degree. If worse comes to worse, do not underestimate the power of tactic number three. Let's say this Ian Juby guy says something provocative, like, the you and carrot lava rocks have Indian artifacts in them, therefore we know they are 800 years old. But the 13 different radio dating methods gave those rocks an age of 10,000 to 2.6 billion years to those rocks. Obviously, the rock dating methods don't work. An excellent response would be, Ian Juby is fat, racist, homophobic, homicidal, dumb. You know, just insert your favorite adjective there. A highly skilled antitheist will manage to fit all of the adjectives into one sentence. For bonus marks and to really make sure people read what you write, throw in random profanities. Notice that you have completely avoided any discussion of the facts, evidence, or conclusions. You have shown the world what this creationist really is by publicly calling them out and clearly raising yourself up in the eyes of the public as the true intellectual that you are. Random profanities also add to your image of intellectual prowess. You also might want to write a book on how evil this god is. You know, the god you just spent hundreds of pages proving he doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, I know. That makes as much sense as writing a book proving Santa Claus doesn't exist, yet then spending 400 pages on how this Santa Claus, who doesn't exist, is such an evil person for judging you and keeping track of whether or not you've been naughty or nice and all. But that's irrelevant. The point is, by penning such a book, first, you can become very famous and make lots of money. And secondly, it will make you feel better to keep on living in your sinful ways, because it will make you and all your readers feel justified in the eyes of many including the eyes of that god that doesn't exist. Of course, that only makes you feel good until Judgment Day, when you actually have to face that god and now have to give an account for all that you wrote. Oh well. Hopefully this tutorial will help the up-and-coming anti-theists, and hopefully others catching this tutorial will more closely examine the remarks and responses of the anti-theists. See for yourself, this is exactly what they do. Another thing you'll notice is that if they actually do stop and attempt to respond to anything I say, almost invariably they will repeat what I said, even agree with it, then say I'm clearly wrong. Don't believe me? Find Crevo Rant number 100 dating methods. Watch it and take bullet points. 
then find response videos or blog posts on the internet or even comments on YouTube. I challenge you, read or listen to the comments made, take notes. Compare what I said to the anti-theists and you'll notice that they repeat exactly what I said and even agree with me. Anyway, enough of that rant for today. In amongst all the hate mail I get, I also got a ton of notes of encouragement and even phone calls saying that the DNA Double Double episode was the best show yet. And then people writing in the following week to say that the Christmas special was better yet. Thanks for the kind words, everyone. I have no idea how to pronounce his YouTube name on the air, wrote in. Hello, Brother Ian. Maybe I have a moment of your time for a brief correction in episode 17. It was stated the opposite of love, hate. The biblical equation is not that the opposite of love is hate, but rather the opposite of love is selfishness. He who takes and gives not again a lifeless dead sea. For God who is love is selfless. Now he went on to showing examples of how God hates various things, including things that violated love. Well, thanks for writing in, and I of course agree. I guess I was just using the generic word hate as people would more easily grasp the concept of the opposite of love. And while it's true that selfishness is the opposite of love, most viewers would not immediately grasp that, so I used the word hate instead. Oren wrote in from Colorado on the origins of the sauropod. There was a snake in times of yore who became a dinosaur. Twas no magician changed his fate, twas just that elephant that he ate. <laughs> Bill Needle wrote in on YouTube, Mr. Juby, if you could explain why humans are mammals, that would be a great Xmas gift. Bill and several others on YouTube had a lengthy debate over this question. Thanks for writing in, Bill. I think I waded through all the comments, but please understand there are hundreds of comments every week on YouTube alone. So if I miss some, please be patient. Bill is simply asking why, from a creationary perspective, would humans have so many similarities to other mammals? To some, this would appear to support evolutionism. As Bill pointed out, all mammals have hair, the obvious mammalry glands with which to nurse their young similar jaw bones, ear bones, etc. Well, actually the term mammal was simply a man-made classification system, and that specific class of organisms was determined to be based upon those which nursed their young. In fact, that classification system was invented by Carl von Linn, better known as Linnaeus, who was a creationist. He coined the term species in his classification system because he believed all these organisms were specially created. So obviously the classification system had nothing to do with evolution. Now while it's true that many mammals share a lot of the same characteristics, there are also a lot of dissimilarities. For example, whales, narwhals, dolphins, and porpoises are also mammals. As such, they have very unique characteristics. They don't have hair. We as humans do not have a large fluke for a tail. And while some of us have blubber layers, the sea-growing creatures have a thick blubber layer for achieving high speed underwater and to insulate their warm blood from the cold water. Humans do not have integrated sonar like these creatures do. The pangolin is also a mammal, but it's covered in armored scales. The echidna, better known as the spiny anteater, is an egg-laying critter, which is also considered a mammal. Now, there are very few similarities between the echidna and other mammals like humans or whales. Same goes with the bats, which could be described as a cross between mammals, whales, reptiles, and birds, and they make up nearly a quarter of all the mammal classes. Again, notice that these types of mammals can hardly be considered similar. The duck-billed platypus is a highly unusual patchwork animal with a bill like a duck, a tail like a beaver, lays eggs like a reptile, and f has feet like an otter, even venom something like a snake. It too is considered a mammal, even though it does not actually have breasts per se, but rather secretes milk through its hair pores, and its young lick the milk from their mother's fur. Now there are also lots of similarities which cross over between mammals and other classes. In fact, these similarities were used to argue for evolution, claiming that mammals evolved from reptiles. So as you can see, Bill, not only are there considerable similarities crossing over between multiple classes, it does not matter what the evidence is. The evidence is then interpreted within the evolutionary paradigm. Now, this does not prove evolution at all. In fact, these similarities are only noted 
when it is believed to support the current evolution mythology. If the similarity does not support or even refutes the current evolution mythology, it is ignored. For example, there's an entire order of dinosaurs called the Ornithischians, so named because of their bird-like hips. It is believed that birds evolved from the dinosaurs, but not the dinosaurs with bird-like hips. The current evolutionary mythology is that birds evolved from the Saurischians, the order of dinosaurs which have hips like a lizard, and includes dinosaurs like the T-Rex and the sauropods. Now in the end, this man-made term really doesn't help nor hinder creation or evolution. It's just a classification system. However, the idea of all these incredible variations of animals, all having milk-producing systems yet so radically depart from each other's design, that does present many challenges to evolutionism, especially because of the many examples of complex systems appearing in unrelated organisms. For example, sonar in the bat and in the whales. The alleged common an evolutionary ancestor between them is assumed to not have sonar of any kind. So now, not only does the bat need to miraculously develop sonar, the whale also needs to develop sonar completely on its own. It's a double miracle, and I don't use that word miracle loosely. Now, you're obviously an intellectual, Bill, so let me leave you with this. If I have to believe in miracles, then why is it a problem to believe that there was a miracle worker behind the miracle? An intelligence who actually designed these incredibly complex systems. An intelligence who designed your intelligently designed brain, which can actually grasp these concepts. Or is it more believable that your brain was the result of randomness and non-intelligence? Can intelligence arise from a rock? because ultimately that is exactly what evolutionism proposes, And I think you would agree that for your astonishingly intelligent brain to arise from rocks would require a miracle. Intelligence does not come from rocks. So those are some thoughts I'll leave you with to ponder with your intelligently designed brain. We have to call this a wrap. I'm out of time. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can send us in your questions, comments, hate mail, and Tim Horton's gift certificates to us in a number of ways. Remember those words of promise, hope, and warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.